you can now hear Movie Heaven, Movie Hell on Stitcher. Stitcher is ready on demand. Listen anytime, anywhere. Stitcher is an award-winning free app that lets you listen to all your favorite shows, plus discover from 20,000 news, entertainment, and sports shows. You can also create your own custom playlists. Stitcher is available on iOS, Android, Nook, iPad, and in over 4 million car dashboards. It's on demand and it's on the go. No downloading, no syncing, no wasted memory. You can stream your favorite podcasts from Stitcher. Don't have Stitcher? Download it free today at stitcher.com or in the App Store. And please leave us a review and rating on Stitcher. Thank you. Welcome to Movie Heaven, Movie Hell with me, Simon Aiken, and... And I'm Keith Isles, and we are both independent filmmakers and lifelong fans of cinema uh, who enjoy talking about other filmmakers' work. And we are nearing the end of our first pass of the A to Z of film directors, both uh, old and new. We are indeed. This is the uh, penultimate episode in our go-around of the A to Z. Wow, there you go. <laughs> right, so tonight we're going to talk about the British director, Peter Yates. Yes, indeed. Yes, so um, according to IMDb, uh, started out as a racing car driver and team manager and then uh, moved on to uh, working in the theatre and then... Um, assisting with uh, directors like Guy Hamilton, who uh, you may know um, passed away recently. And, uh, yeah, and uh, did uh, TV, did uh, shows like The Saint and Danger Man. But, of course, Keith, what was his first film that he made? Uh, the first film that he made was, well, was that would that have been Summer Holiday? It would be indeed, with Cliff... <laughs> <laughs> there you go but no no i mean an in, another another brit director uh another director that's that's one of those he's got quite a massive body of work um you know quite a varied body of work in terms of different genres and different types of movie um and you know in some respects maybe a bit like when we talked back, back on i when we talked about john irwin um which you, you know not everybody necessarily knew who he was but when you mentioned the films everybody sort of knew the films and I think uh probably very much you know the case with Peter Yates um uh he died a, he died a few years back um aged 81 but you know had obviously been working in the industry as you've already mentioned as as a assistant director and, and other roles for for some years and um yeah I mean you, you know from my point of view, I always I always knew the name. I didn't know too much about him, to be perfectly honest, until uh, until reading up a bit more for this this podcast. But I always knew his films and and always knew the name. And uh, you know, was I think he was pretty consistent at uh, you, you know knocking out decent movies. Um, but as I said, he he, he never. He never seemed to have a necessarily a particular style. Uh, he he always sort of dealt with different genres and had you know, which must have been very nice for him. Quite a varied career, I think, in terms of his output. Well, I saw an interview uh, just before recording this, and um, it was a really old TV show. Uh, must have been sort of, uh, I would say, about sort of seventy three. And um, it was like really old, grainy black and white. And uh, these kids were interviewing him. You know, uh, they're all like young reviewers. And uh, one of the things he said was that he just didn't like to be pigeonholed. Because up to that point, he had been known for doing um, car chases in films. Because he had uh, kind of revolutionized um, uh, chase scenes in films because... Uh, what they used to do, 
uh, especially on TV, was that if there was a car chase, you would see a car go around the corner, but you wouldn't continue with it. It would just go out of screen and then it may cut again. And what he was known for was following the vehicles around and, you know, also driving on actual locations on, you know, streets with people on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um <laughs> <laughs> stunt people though right <laughs> maybe i mean um <laughs> i mean <laughs> well they didn't have they uh on the french connection they didn't have stunt people they had real people that you know when gene hackman crashes into the uh the lady with the shopping trolley full of cans mm-hmm. that weren't no stunt double really okay yeah. oh fair enough but you, you gotta remember as much as we look at that as a cliche, when that film first came out, that was the first time you, you ever saw that sort of stunt. So, you know, we now see that in every, you know, if there's a car chase and, and a trolley full of cans do not get knocked over, we kind of feel cheated. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I must admit they, uh, you know, since Freakin did that, they've, uh, they put it in everything right down to that famous bit in speed <laughs> <laughs> yes where she goes oh my god oh my god i hit the baby <laughs> no it was, it, was, it was a trolley full of cans <laughs> that's it and so us as audience members couldn't feel cheated at all could we? <laughs> <laughs> well yeah um well as i sort of mentioned his sort of uh connection to guy hamilton and uh i think we should sort of just quickly mention the fact that uh you know just one of the sort of great British directors sort of passed away. I mean, he was in his 90s when he passed away. So, you know, he had a good run. He had a good innings, but um, but yes, uh, definitely. I mean, very much a man responsible for shaping the, the, the Bond series of films that we talk about a lot on this podcast. And um, yes. yeah, yeah, very sad. I mean, you know, 2016 is turning out to be a bit of a sort of sad year for losing people. Um, and, yeah. you, you know... It, you kind of realise you're getting old when all your childhood heroes and influences start dying. But uh, this this year has been particularly bad for that. So, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's sad, sad that he was also added to, to that list, even though I think the man did have a full life and, uh, and, and, and you know, left quite a legacy behind him. So, um, but yes, uh, absolutely. Um, you, you, you know, Peter Yates did work with him and directors yeah. like, like Jay Lee Thompson, you know, on things like The Guns of Navarone and uh, Tony Richardson and, you know, various, various directors. So, I mean, that's kind of, I think, where he learned his craft. And, and obviously he worked a lot on um, uh, adverts, as, as many other directors that we've, we've talked about um, have early in their career as well. So um, it, 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 uh, it taught him how to do things, you know, on a schedule and, um you know, you know, how to how to take some risks and, and and things of that nature, which I think is kind of what got him noticed and 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 uh, you know in the position that he ended up being. Well, yeah, I mean, he he did, you know, he worked on two very big influential series in the sixties, which is The Saint and Danger Man. And of course, uh, for those who don't know, Danger Man was kind of like the prequel to The Prisoner. Do you know, I've never seen Danger Man. Can you believe that? I have seen The Saint, but not The Danger Man. It was very hard to see up to, I think, like um, only like 10 years ago when finally it came out on DVD. But it was I, it wasn't sort of as freely available as The Prisoner was. Right. Because, right. I mean, you know, The Prisoner, they had like VHS copies and DVDs and, you know, maybe get a Blu-ray of it one day. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> We can review that. <laughs> but then he had a very good reason why he didn't do The Prisoner. And I think that should lead us into uh, your pick for Movie Heaven. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, my pick for Movie Heaven, you know, we've already sort of mentioned about uh, car chases, etc. So it's, it's it's no big stretch to say that I've, uh, I've gone for the film uh, Bullet from 1968, starring the, the, the great Steve McQueen. Um, and uh yeah i mean this was actually the first film that steve mcqueen produced uh obviously steve mcqueen by this point had had quite a career 
you know, he'd done his films with, uh, you know, the John Sturgis films and the Norman Jewison films, etc., and was in quite a, you know, he, he was the sort of leading, powerful Hollywood man. Um, and, uh, you, you know, was now moving into producing films and having a lot more creative control over, over what was out there. Um, and he actually hand-selected uh, Peter Yates for the job of directing this because he'd seen a film uh, that Peter Yates had done called Robbery, uh, um, which also involved a, a rather impressive car chase. And of course, you know, Steve McQueen, you know, himself liking liking cars and car chases and, well, chases of, of any kind, um, sort of wanted wanted uh, Peter to, to get involved in this and, and actually come on board and do this. So this was Peter Yates's first Hollywood uh, movie. Up until that, it had been all British films that he'd worked on. So this was a really good opportunity for him to... Uh, to make that leap over to Hollywood and um, uh, and come up with a with this film, which, as you've mentioned, you know, obviously uh, things such as you know Freakin's French Connection, through to Ronan, to Jack Reacher, e even to the Fast and Furious films to a certain extent, have all probably uh, been somewhat influenced uh, and taken various notes from. From, from the you know the style of car chase that, that that was set up in this film. I just wanted to say, so uh, you don't think that Steve McQueen chose him for uh, his handling of a bus in um, Summer Holiday, then? <laughs> Quite possibly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do have a, quite any musical numbers in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one of the stories I've got about the french connection is because the producer of bullet also produced the french connection and he set down the the challenge of two freaking he said well i've just directed bullet and we've got the best chase scene ever filmed but this film french connection i want it to be better and they did i had i must admit i i think as much as i think the uh car chase in bullet is great I think the car chase in French Connection is far more um, exciting, edge of your seat, and also because you know you're tense because you you want uh, Gene Hackman, you want Popeye Dole to catch that uh, you know that French assassin. So you know, I with this, uh, you don't really know the guys you, who he's chasing, or well. What, who were chasing him originally and then he turns the tables i mean you only see one of them in a scene earlier at the hospital where they try and uh well they do kill um their witness but um but the, but the thing is the stakes aren't as high and that's why i think sort of the chase in the french connection is great yeah no i i, I no i take your point absolutely i mean i think i think I think one of the things that makes uh, Bullet so iconic is, uh, you, know, you know, the fact that you've got the Mustang and and you've got obviously the Dodge Charger that it's that it's chasing with. So you've got the real the real muscle cars in this one, um, you know, very iconic. And also that you know, you know the fact that that, that you've got Steve McQueen in it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and and Steve McQueen doing his own stunts as well. He is behind the wheel of that car for most of that chase. Absolutely. And he makes sure you know it by even leaning out the window in points so that you can actually see that it's him and all this sort of stuff, which, uh, which, which is great. I mean, um, you know, in terms of iconography uh, in this film as well, I mean, you know, ever since I can remember, uh, you know, I've been a, a movie fan my whole life. And ever since I can remember that classic, um, pose of McQueen you, you know with with the short haircut and and the roll neck uh sweater and the and the shoulder holster I mean that that's been one of those iconic images uh, I remember I, I used to, I've got a mug set at home which is basically that's one of them and then I've got um El Pacino is Tony Montana with the machine gun you know hello my little friend uh, and I've got 
say say hello to my little friend. And I'm, yeah, there um, you go. <laughs> and I'm, uh, wow, is that? Can I, sorry, is that like the uh, PG? Is that like the censored version? Hello, to, hello, friend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the TV version where they have to cut all the swearing out. Uh, and it, and I've, it's also got um, Clint is dirty Harry with the uh, forty four Magnum and. Mm. Uh, um, Michael Caine from from Get Carter with the uh, the pump action shotgun. So that that's the set of four. And as I said, obviously one of them is 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 McQueen. Um, you know, in that classic pose. And it's funny because uh, another thing that's interesting, you know, again iconography wise with the whole sort of wardrobe that they had McQueen in in this is is again that's never really dated. You know, he kind of wears a sports jacket, jeans, uh, and a roll neck, which you know, even today, that doesn't make it look like an old film, you know, necessarily. So, uh, um, yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of cool things in this film. Um, one, one of the things that, that they did that was a little bit different is the original script um, was supposed to be set in Los Angeles. Uh, they chose to oh, actually right. use San Francisco because at the time, San Francisco hadn't been used quite as much. Uh, it, you know, in the movies at that point, whereas there'd been a lot of police procedurals took place in Los Angeles, both on television um, and on the big screen. Um, oh, yeah. The other, oh, yeah, because it's like the City of Angels with Dragnet. Exactly. The, 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 other, the other thing they did was um, that it, rather than working on sets, they actually used real locations through this uh, film to give it a, to try and give it a very realistic film. And he, even... The, the, the laws weren't as strict with um, unions for, for extras and things of that nature back in back in the late 60s as well. So often, like when you see the scenes in the hospital, they're in a real hospital with real doctors and nurses, you know, performing procedures, etc. You know, you know, to give it that really um, realistic uh, feel and, and something, you know, that was unusual. It's got this very I mean, McQueen wanted. And this is sort of what Peter Yates brought to it was this very sort of European style of movie um, at the time, which was very different to what was typically done in in Hollywood. And I, I think actually going back and rewatching this was quite interesting because it made me realize, um, you know, how different uh, the style of film was then in terms of pacing, because. Yes, you've got the car chase, which is really, you know, fast moving. But other than that, this film is actually a fairly slow burner. And it's and it's a fairly, you know, measured in terms of pace and performance and, and things of that nature. And and it's quite interesting sort of watching it with with today's eyes, you know. Well, it just oozes cool, isn't it? It was it is it's one of those films where it's just cool. I mean, you've got the soundtrack uh by um oh Lalo Schiffen, you know, very jazz influenced, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean you you're right. I mean if it was made today it would be a lot faster and a lot more things would happen. But saying that, I'm still kind of confused about what happens at the beginning. So you know you've got the opening titles which are just amazing the way with the um the the edits would change with the titles that's right it would kind of go through the letters that's it yeah, yeah. the letters would come through the screen and reveal the next shot i'm still quite sure what they because you see all these guys these you know the the members of the organization i guess they couldn't say mafia uh I, i'm not quite sure what they did it's is it a robbery yeah i mean it's kind of weird because it, this is in terms of like sort of plot devices and whatever it's it's weird because we kind of you know when we follow the story with with uh, frank bullet we, we're kind of following the the b story in in many respects and you've kind of um you, you know that that a story sort of just literally happens over over the beginning credits which is kind of the the, the back story that sets up why they've got this um witness in protection um but yeah, I mean, it, it is it is a slightly convoluted in terms of um, what exactly, you know, you know, what why what exactly happened there or what he witnessed um, to be put into that, uh, you know, under the protection of of the um, 
because uh, obviously that was all supposed to take place in Chicago, wasn't it? That that uh, that that uh, credit sequence part. This this is the thing. I mean, I've, I've I have seen this film many times, but there's still there's still sort of parts of the story I don't quite understand. So I didn't even know that was taking place in Chicago. <laughs> yeah, I, I must have missed that line of dialogue. <laughs> yeah, well, you you see that crime boss, you know, at the end of it on on the phone, and uh, you, you, you know, I I guess that that Johnny Johnny Ross, um, you, you know, had, had witnessed something, uh, and 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 you know, obviously flees across to the other, um, you, you know, the other coast or whatever, but. You're right. It, it isn't. It isn't the. Uh, it isn't the easiest to follow. Definitely. Uh, uh, interestingly, you know, the reunited of, of of two of the magnificent seven. Sadly, the, yes. the first one to die, and and the only one that's still alive, <laughs> in, in in Robert <laughs> Vaughan. Um, yes. And and obviously playing this, uh, you know, politician uh, called I think it's Chalmers or Ch- Chalmers. His, his no, that's captain. right. It's Chalmers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, you know, he he plays it rather well because I guess at the time he was he was best known for being you know the man from Uncle. So th- this this was yeah. this was a slightly a slightly more sinister and 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 sleazy sleazy role for him really. Um, but uh, yeah, you know you know it's good. I I have to say that it's also got features the lovely uh, Jacqueline Bissett. Yeah, in this. Mm. Um, but I did feel that she was somewhat underused. It was kind of she was there to to show that um, to show that Bullet had you know like a hot girlfriend or whatever. But uh, <laughs> she didn't actually do a m- much in it or serve the story particularly. I mean, she was used as like a foil, I guess. I mean, there's there's the whole bit where he's 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 kind of figured out that the the witness they had under protection was actually the wrong person. That there was some there was some form of mix up because he dam you know damaged his car in uh, in the chase and unfortunately the the police precinct didn't have a replacement unfortunately they were all out <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> she has to drive him to this hotel and of course she gets a glimpse to, of to see what his life is and of course it's that whole thing it's like oh you live in a sewer um, and I don't know if I want to live there with you. Kind of thing. Yeah, so. she did kind of get her one scene, didn't she? Yeah, where she splurges yeah. all of that out, which, uh, which you know, in, interestingly, you know, McQueen being, you know, as as he's famous for being, um, you know, a man of a man of few words, and it's interesting because there are lots of scenes where the person he's opposite has quite a bit of dialogue, uh, and McQueen always finds some bit of business to do uh i thought the bit yes. in the hospital with he's got the milk in the sandwich was brilliant <laughs> it, <laughs> it's so cool you know um, do you know the story about uh on the magnificent seven with him and yul brenner yeah he was always flicking his hat and stuff <laughs> and you'll you'll just sort of stopped him and he said look he said all i have to do is take the hat off and nobody will look at you <laughs> <laughs> Yes. No, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, um, there was definitely some ego, but it all worked in his favour in most cases, I would say. <laughs> so this story uh, kind of sums him up well. Um, he did a feature film called Hell is for Heroes with uh, Don Siegel. And uh, at the end of the film, he was supposed to cry. He was supposed to see his sort of uh, comrades in arms dying and he was supposed to cry and um Steve McQueen said I can't cry. And Don Siegel, Oh, you must be able to cry. And they, they tried a few tricks, including slapping him, and they just nothing. No reaction. So <laughs> So when he's sort of very quiet and playing with things, you know, it was his way of emoting, yeah. I guess. No, I mean I you know, obviously um I love everything he does and obviously he's he's inspired so many uh so many actors. It's interesting, actually, because a lot of the actors that were sort of my heroes growing up, uh, he he was their hero, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like interesting uh, where you mm. see um, where inspiration comes from and whatever. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it, back you know, sort of back to um, uh, Peter Yates's direction of this. Um, 
You, you know, I, I do. I think the movie, um, I can see why, you know, I've heard people say it's kind of slow. Um, and I can see why people would say that, but I don't think it necessarily is, is, is a bad thing because even though it's slow, it's very, very engaging. I mean, uh, you're, you're kind of with it all the way through. And like you mentioned, you, you know, he, he chose uh, Lalo Schifrin for this, who was very sort of of that time. He obviously, you know, uh, a couple of years later, he, he went on to do the, the, the Dirty Harry films. And of course, he, he you know, he'd done the Mission Impossible uh, TV series and things of that nature. But what, what was really good is, um, and what I really noticed in this was how often they didn't use any music which was quite interesting, uh, you, mm. you know, from from the car chase to the uh, even to the chase in the airport uh, towards the end of the film. Um, it was really interesting that, that they didn't, you know, that they held off. And that, again, they kept that very real feel by having no no background music whatsoever and just letting the um, the action sequences play out. So um so, 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 yeah, I mean, you know, his music's very iconic and, and, and works, but it's, it's used very sparingly in this film. Um, I noticed that that was something that was quite, you know, apparent um, watching it this time round. I was like, mm, interesting. When watching the finale of this, the, um, the scene at the airport, did you get a bit of deja vu? Uh, I because I did it, it. It felt very much like the end of the rookie. Oh right, okay. I thought you were going to say heat for some reason because of obviously the airport stuff in that. But heat is completely different because it's it takes place on the runway. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so, so uh, did some of the, some of this. That's what well, I he, he, they they run across a runway, but the main action takes place in a terminal, yeah. like the rookie does. Well, I have to admit, no. To 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 me, <laughs> the rookie is awful, <laughs> and this is great. So. Uh... No, oh yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> if anybody could go back and listen to our Clint Eastwood episode, we, you can hear our full thoughts on the on the film. I'm not. You know, it was just. I'm just saying that when I was watching it, I was kind of get. You know, uh, a sense that the rookie probably had got their influence for that uh, end shootout uh, from this film. Quite possibly. Quite possibly. But didn't pull it. Even though we love Clint, he didn't pull it off quite as well, did he? <laughs> no, 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 no. But. No. Uh, but no, I mean, I mean, it's it's um, um, you know, I, I think I think the, it wasn't it wasn't a big stretch for me to sort of think of this as movie um, heaven because you know it was it was Peter Yates's first um, Hollywood film that, that obviously paved the way to many other things for him. But you, you know, it is an iconic film. Uh, it's a very influential film, and um, you, you know, I think as a uh you know police police action drama thriller you, you know it, it works on on all those levels and uh you, you know some great performances you know not just from uh steve mcqueen himself but you know robert robert vaughn's very good in this film um also and also an early um an early film for he didn't get much screen time but robert devell plays the uh the cab driver in this one as well so um yeah Apparently yeah. he did have a bigger role, but it was it was very much cut down in the in the final edit of the film, um, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but uh, yeah, but I mean, I have to say I, I can't see how much more the the cabbie could have brought to the story. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe you, you know they used him more in terms of you, you know following people and getting lifts and stuff i, I i'm not sure but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but you, you know um, wouldn't it be great to think there's an alternative cut of this film yeah, where robert is... devall's driving people around and like they're following people yeah, there's no <laughs> oh no no there's the, there's the car chase <laughs> but in between especially after he he crashes the car that uh you know uh Steve McQueen's been driven around by Robert Duvall for the whole film. I'd love to. I think I'd love to see that. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to see that. No, I think that that would be very cool. But uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, you know, the the things that make this unique is, is is you know his his use of, as I said, real locations, um, and and you know just the way this was this was shot and edited and how sparingly the music was used, uh, and and the measured performances. It just made it a lot different to, I think, what audiences 
um, you know, back in back in the day, back in the late 60s, were, were probably used to seeing. And um, it's interesting that it does, you know, even though it's an old film and obviously, you know, they're not on mobile phones and things of that nature, of course. It, but on some merit, it still kind of holds up today. It, it works when you watch it. You don't necessarily feel like you're watching an old film. Dirty Harry's like that as well. It hasn't aged at all, really. No. I mean, you depart from the sort of the fashions, but I mean, but that's but that's sort of just having look back at time, look at what that was like back in those days. But story wise and acting, all just it's just great. Yeah. All right. Before we move on, I I think I'd be amiss uh, not to mention the um, the Ford advert that uh, <laughs> they they nicked all the shots from for this because um, very used. <laughs> when when watching this film again, I could see the shots that they used uh, for that Ford car advert because they uh, well mostly they just replaced the Mustang with um, with the Ford car. It was, no, no, it's not a Ford car. It was a um, it was a Puma, wasn't it? Was it was a Puma. Yeah, it was Ford a Puma. Puma. And I have to say, uh, it's probably the best bit of advertising I've ever seen because to this day, I'd still like to buy a Puma. <laughs> really? Just off the back, <laughs> yeah. Just off the back of watching that uh, advert, yes. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, even though you know, it, it, they just you know, super, they just sort of CGI'd. Um, you know the four Puma over his sort of his Mustang. So <laughs> that's interesting that you want a Ford Puma, Simon. I, I, I like that we've got that out of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to buy me one, I will be very happy to receive it. Buy you a Ford Puma, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but you, you're you're right. I mean, it, it was a very good piece of advertising, and and of course, yeah. um, that you know, as we've already mentioned, that whole sequence has, has has become so iconic and so influential with other with other films and i think i um i think i mentioned in the in the spielberg one when i was talking about duel that um they actually did use the the camera car rig um that they used on this film for duel in the end so mm. that they could get those low angle uh shots of the road you know coming around the car and stuff it was the, the same way that um that they filmed a lot of the, uh, the, the the sequences in that wonderful chase. Oh, I'm sure they used the same camera rig in um, in the French Connection. I mean, once you come up with a rig like that, it gets used. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, but no, all round all round a a very cool film, uh, a very stylish film, and a, you know definitely something that set the bar pretty high. I think for um for Peter Yates's career moving forward. So, um, yeah, uh, if anybody hasn't seen it, I, I highly recommend it. Yes, it says well worth checking out. Right, well, we're moving on to my pick, and uh, I'm going to get all nostalgic because I've picked Kroll oh, from lovely 1983. Film. Yes, I had such <laughs> fun going back and watching this one, such fun. So thank you so much for picking it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I saw this on video and um, it was one of those rare cases where my my cousin rented this for me on the day of release. Which All right. As somebody, as as you know, know too well, Keith, that uh, back in the day to get a, a copy of a VHS rental on the day of release was so difficult. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't think I was able to get this on day of release. So, yeah, well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, it was all due to the fact that um, I don't know if it was on TV or if it was on other videos where they would show like the sort of making of, you know, like the 10, 10 minute EPK. Because I remember seeing that before seeing the film. Yeah, well, this is one of this was quite an early example of of, of um, you know that, that kind of uh, making of. They, they they were a lot more sort of few and far between at the time, and um, and yeah, they did do quite a comprehensive one on this film actually. So. Well, I mean, one of the other selling points was it had Todd Carty in it, <laughs> who was uh, you know in Grange Hill at the time. Yeah, Tucker Jenkins and uh, future what is it, Mark Fowler from <laughs> EastEnders? Is that is that right? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, he, he must have been, you know, pretty young at the time. I was very young at the time. Um, I, was, I mean, I was a, a very young Liam Neeson. Robbie Coltrane. Yeah. Very early roles for a lot of these guys, but um, but yeah, what 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 an enjoyable. I mean, again, I like you. I saw it on um, uh, VHS back in the day. Uh, it was kind of around that time of. You know, fantasy movies like Hawk the Slayer and Beastmaster and, 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 and things of that nature. But what was always kind of fun about this was it kind of it, it was kind of a, a mixture of, of, of sci-fi and, and fantasy, wasn't it? It kind of it kind of mixed oh, yeah. the two genres quite nicely. Well, it, it was sold as uh, Star Wars meets Lord of the Rings. Perfect. Yeah, I would say that's absolutely perfect. Um uh, description and if you remember the original poster um the the pose that uh the main hero uh colwyn is in is very reminiscent of the star wars poster yes with the glaive in his hand for some reason on the on the original one the glaive's got beams shooting off it <laughs> which of course is not what it ever did no no <laughs> Well, I have to. I have to say. I mean, um, I've always said, and I and I still stand by this that the the uh, coolest uh, fictional on-screen hand weapon of all time is obviously the lightsaber, right? But um, but yeah. y y you know, if we were doing like a top ten, I would say that the glaive would definitely be in there. You know, along with the phaser from Star Trek, the the, the pulse rifles from Aliens, and. Uh, probably uh the mind sword from the aforementioned hawk the slayer you know <laughs> uh i i would always go for the um samurai sword from highlander oh there you go yeah another cool weapon no it, a absolutely actually two very cool weapons because the kurgan's weapon was pretty cool especially the 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 pop-up spikes oh what the broadsword yeah with the big with the yeah spikes. yeah yeah very very, very <laughs> kylo ren <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, I just love that scene. In sorry to go off on a tangent, but in Highlander, where he's putting the sword together because he's actually, he actually, you know, it's like putting like a a sniper weapon together. That's right. And you see him in the hotel room, and then it sort of, you know, he goes the oh, quickening, and then this sort of prostitute goes in, comes in, and she goes, "Hi, I'm Cherry." Yeah, I'm Candy goes, or something. Of course you are. Course you are. <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> Oh no, classic, <laughs> classic, absolutely. But um, no, I mean, I mean, you know, this this was really this was really fun to go back and um, go back and watch. And interestingly, um, you know, we mentioned about uh, obviously with bullets and and you know it, it it's kind of you know pacing that 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 you know by by today's standards could seem quite slowly paced and whatever. And and with this film, I mean, it was it was completely the opposite. I mean, we, th this film cracked right on with the storytelling and characters right from the start and moved along at a hell of a pace, didn't it? Did you feel like that when you watched it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, my only complaint would be is that the, um, the acting at the beginning is slightly dodgy, you know, where you have the whole... Um, uh, Colwyn and Lissa together in the marriage, and the, especially the fathers, it's very sort of exposition heavy. Oh, very, yes. But high, high drama, and and I have to say, I think that's what may turn a lot of people off because it, it seems a bit too much. But once we get past that initial attack, once um, Freddie Jones turns up as veneer, then it's it, it then that's 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 when it really comes to life. Yeah. You know, yeah, and it's a real. I mean, it's a real journey. I mean, they set off on this sort of yeah. Arthurian adventure, don't they? Which is um... they do, yes. Well, I mean, it's the 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 story is quite simple. So um, you have this uh, creature called the Beast uh, who conquers worlds with his uh, army of slayers, and um, they have uh, arrived on Krull, the planet of Kroll. And um, the beast kidna kidnaps this princess called Alyssa and um, Colwyn, her betrothed, has to try and find her. Now, the thing is, the beast lives in a castle that every day it moves to a different location. And 
there's there's no rhyme or reason of where this where it's going to be it could be anywhere on the planet and so his task is to find out where that castle is going to be and then and get an, an army together and storm it and it's it, it works so well it works no so it so well. does it so does i mean um you know, uh, Derek Meddings was responsible for a lot of the uh, the visual effects work, and you know, cer- certainly the miniatures um, are on on this film, and and they really are. I mean, y- you know, the the watching this recently, uh, you know, in the past week or so, um, you know, some of the effects work in this, bearing in mind that it was you know long long before the days of CG when everything was done using miniatures and models and, you know, photochemical process and things of that nature. Um, you, you know, mo- most of them, they're one or two dodgy, but most of them hold up pretty well, I think, don't you? Well, yeah, it's the uh, the blue screens a bit. Uh, it, they were still sort of experimenting with it. But the amazing thing, though, was they were able to get uh, these horses trained on treadmills to, so that they could film them in front of a, a, a blue screen. That's right. Yeah, Vic Armstrong was the coordinator, wasn't he? I was just going to say that. I was going to say it's another appearance by Vic Armstrong. He works a lot. He does. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he uh, during the eighties, he just seemed to be in everything. I mean, he was he was even a bus driver in American Wolf in London. <laughs> no, I mean the the way they um the way they handled this was was quite imaginative. I mean, obviously, you, you, you know, rather than over cranking or under cranking the camera, uh, which had sort of been done to death with movies, um, you, you know, you know, for some years, to actually uh, come up with that, you know, whole treadmill and then use the, uh, you, you know, the fire effects. Um, yeah, I, I thought that worked rather well. I thought that was that was kind yeah. of fun. <laughs> Well, for those who don't know, the fire effects was that these horses were traveling so fast that they actually le- left a, a trail of fire behind them. And there is a moment when they, they go off a cliff and you just see these uh, fire trails in the air. It's just, it's great. And of course, what makes it even better is the music by James Horner. Yes. Yeah. I mean, again, a, a, a very sad loss last year. You know, James Horner was. Yeah. Um, uh, a sad casualty of the great composers but um yeah an early score you know in some places quite reminiscent actually of um Ralph of Khan that he'd done the year previous uh but not so much not so much i mean i i, I know the i know the two scores very well and um I, I, yes it does have his signature to it but they're they're very quite different yeah i mean it's scores, it's got some of those sort of swashbuckly bits that uh, yes that, that, oh yeah, yeah. That, that's very him um well if you think of the soundtrack to rafa khan being like a naval adventure the soundtrack to a naval adventure and this being a fantasy then you can kind of really see the differences there's nothing in there that uh is sort of very similar um it, but if you go back and listen to uh, his soundtrack to Battle Beyond the Stars, then you can hear some of the stuff he used in um, in Rafa Khan there. Yeah, yeah, well, that was his first one, wasn't it? So, um, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, you, you know, a great soundtrack. It really works for this. It's very uplifting. Uh, a lot, and again, in contrast to what we were talking about with Bullet, um, you, you know, where where you know the music cues were were fairly sparing sparingly used in that in this one there is actually quite a lot of music in this i mean it, it you know it goes for quite a bit of the um the, the the film without a pause and uh you know impressive that he could come up with um with all of that you know <laughs> well yeah but i mean you you know this is you're living in the aftermath of star wars which um a lot of the studios were trying to make their own Star Wars, and Kroll was supposed to be Columbia Pictures is a Star Wars. I mean, it got a summer release and everything, but uh, I don't think it did too very didn't do very well at the cinema. I don't remember it being at the cinema. I'm sure it was, but I don't remember anybody going to see it, and I don't remember every advertising. I just I just remember the push for VHS. Yeah, yeah. I mean, same here. I definitely didn't didn't see it on the big screen and wasn't even aware if it was. But um, uh, yeah, it, it was it was it was in that really good time of videos where it, there was new stuff coming out all of the time. And um, 
and mm. uh, yeah, th you know, this this did sort of have that balance, like you said about, um, you know, on one hand Star Wars, but on the other hand, you know, a more fantasy adventure like Lord of the Rings. In fact, actually, um, that the whole bit, which is a great sequence, um, you, you know, with the where he goes to see the uh, the Witch of the Web or whatever she's called, you know, and oh, um, the Widow of the Web, and, uh, the Widow of the Web, and um, you've got this you know, the sort of crystalline spider um, sequence. Uh, I know obviously that was all done sort of stop motion and whatever, but it did it did feel reminiscent of things that, that Peter Jackson did, you, you know, much later in the, in the uh, Lord of the Rings stroke Hobbit movies, you know? <laughs> yeah, so the uh, that spider really holds up and, um, you know, still really creepy. I mean, it's, you know, especially the fact that it's kind of translucent. It's not just white, but you can actually see you know under the skin a bit and you can see a bit of red and you know it's it's just really well done and of course you you know god you wouldn't you would not want to meet a, a spider like that no well, i remember in my youth i found that kind of quite scary actually <laughs> so yeah it's it was it was well done and um you, you know a, a a very a very tense scene actually that one i do like the way they handled that well, I mean, the other thing as well is that it's quite a revelation if you've never seen it in widescreen before, because it, it it really uses that um, anamorphic uh, widescreen. So it's just, it just looks so great. It's like, bloody hell, you, you missed so much when it came to the pan and scan. I mean, I'd love, I would have loved to have seen it at the cinema, actually, especially the, the whole climbing up the mountain. I imagine on the big screen that would have looked amazing. Yeah, in fact, this is probably the uh, the first time that I actually got to see the film in its in its correct aspect ratio, uh, because I'm sure when it was out on the uh, the VHS back in the day, it was probably a pan and scan version, no doubt. So, um, so oh, it was. So yeah, so no, I, I mean, uh, Clive actually kind of was kind enough to loan me his DVD of this, and it was what it's one of those rare examples where. In terms of special features, the DVD actually has a lot more on it than the uh, Blu-ray. Um, the Blu-ray of Kroll, which has been released, just has literally the film on it. Um, but this uh, actually had quite a lot of extras, um, you know, for the age of the film. It, it did have that making of documentary um, that, that you mentioned at the beginning. But also it had, it's funny, last and the last, the, on the Alien podcast i mentioned um uh, magazines and stuff that you used to read interviews in and um this has actually got a commentary track which is the cine fantastique um review for the film uh, actually recorded as a commentary okay. track which is quite interesting um so, so that that was quite good there is also a uh, a commentary with um with Peter Yates and, and some of the cast and crew. Actually, one of the really cool extras that they had um, was, I don't know whether you remember back in the day, but um, Marvel uh, Comics seemed to have the licensing for, for everything. They obviously did Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica and, and you, you know, most, most of the titles out there. And uh, they, yeah, they actually did a, a, a comic book of, of Kroll and one of the features on this was um, they had it as a motion comic. Um, and that's where they actually sort of photograph the, 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 the comic and pan across the panels. And then um, they, they lay in the soundtrack of the movie with it. So you get the music and the dialogue and the sound effects of the movie, along with um, the imagery fr from the comic book. Um, and uh you, you know obviously it's it's slightly abridged and whatever but but it but it works quite well and um i've seen this once before um they they did it with uh alan moore's watchman uh as a, as a motion comic just before um uh the Zack snyder film came out and um it, it's interesting because it's kind of this it's not quite an animated movie but it's sort of a uh this sort of weird hybrid of of a, of a co comic book meets an audio, audio drama if you know what i mean but it actually worked quite nice <laughs> i do know what you mean um uh, i don't know if you've ever uh checked out the app uh comic comicology but they do a similar thing where they they kind of animate the panels 
uh, a really good one I saw was actually for Batman 66. Oh, right. Okay. Where they would have the speech bubbles appear as you would sort of uh, swipe along. So it, it, things would appear in the frame and it was kind of like an animation. Uh, a, a bit more sophisticated than what they've done for the DVD, but it's uh, it's certainly along those lines. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I do I do remember the Kroll comic book. Um, I had the UK version, which was uh, the two comic books together. So you had the, the on the cover, it was the uh, poster for the film. And it was about A4 size because uh, Marvel Comics over here in the UK, they were sort of printed on a on a, a bigger paper than the US ones. Wow, you mean we actually we actually did something bigger than the US? Good lord, no <laughs> <Go> figure. <laughs> well, we used I used to get um, like the Star Wars comic books and uh, Transformers as well. I remember being that size, and they were about the same size as two thousand AD and Eagle comics. So, I think that was just the way they were printed over here. Hmm, interesting, interesting. But that no, I thought that yeah. was a rather cool little feature that was on the um on the dvd special edition and uh obviously isn't present on 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 the blu-ray uh that and obviously having the cine fantastic um you know review as as, as a com as a red commentary track uh you, you know i also thought was quite a nice touch so they actually um they went to quite a lot of effort uh with this film i guess knowing that it's got a bit of a a cult fan following um i suppose i mean this is this is one of the things that um i get quite annoyed with now with some of the blu-ray releases like as you were saying the blu-ray release for crow is that they just put the film out on blu-ray and that was it and didn't even bother porting over the extras from the dvd and you should you know by right be getting more on the blu-ray as as, as far as i'm concerned you know apart from obviously better picture and sound quality but um you know you should have all the extras if if, if not more so um indeed yeah indeed but i mean this i have to say the the film is a pg but it's a tough pg this is before they um you know we had the 12 rating and the pg 13 rating so i mean there's quite some gruesome deaths in here i mean the um the way the seer gets killed you know by the uh, the long fingernails into his neck. Yeah. And the whole, oh, what was it in the 80s about death by quicksand? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, this is, again, this was um, one of the things that they sort of touch on on the, um, on the uh, extras on the DVD was the fact that this was actually obviously shot at Pinewood on the 007 soundstage. And uh, that was one of the things they did quite well, I thought, was sort of creating this otherworldly look. Um, and yes, some, the, the sets and everything were quite impressive. But you're right, it was a uh, death by quicksand. <laughs> it was quite, <laughs> quite popular. In fact, in fact, Clive made a really interesting point when he, when he loaned me the, um, the disc. He knew, obviously, we were, we were going to do Yates. And uh, he said, um, in some respects, Yates's career kind of parallels Mike Hodge's career slightly in so much as you know he starts off with a with a sort of gritty uh action thriller and ends up sort of doing a uh uh, a slightly camp sci-fi adventure (laughs) (laughs) well i mean mike hodges is is a lot more camper than this well yeah no absolutely (laughs) i mean flash gordon is way camp it is it is there's no there's no brian blessed in this film no no, absolutely. Um, interesting. Uh, the, the the actor uh, Ken Marshall, who um, who played the lead in this, Colwyn, you know, who was who was sort of your your, your typical leading man at the time, but um, uh, he didn't seem to go on to do a great deal uh, after this. I mean, I, I do remember he had sort of a semi regular uh, part in in some of the seasons of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, where he was kind of a, a foil to Cisco. It was so weird because, I mean, you, you had like, uh, you know, it was must have been like 10 or 15 years in between this, between Kroll and, and Deep Space Nine. Yeah. yeah, it was a long time, yeah. And so he had changed so much. I mean, he wasn't recognisable at all. Yeah. And, um, but yet he was 
still I, I think he had grown so much as an actor because certainly in Deep Space Nine he was a really good character and uh, I liked the way they sort of you know used him I mean it was it's funny because he compared himself to the main character in Les Mis, didn't he? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they said that they had that kind of relationship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny how the sort of the main players in this didn't really go on too much. I mean, you've got uh, Leslie Anthony as well, who had the weird thing that happened to her on this film is she was dubbed. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's not her original voice. The... Um, the actress who dubbed her is uh, Lindsay Krauss, who you may know from, um, is it, uh, not House of Cards, was, was, she was in the Mammoth film. Oh, oh right. House of Games. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, you'd know, if, I mean, she's been in The Insider and all kinds of different films, but uh, yeah, they had this weird thing where um, they had to, they, they dubbed... Uh, Leslie Anthony's voice. It was just really. Well, that was done quite a I lot don't know why. Back, back in those days, wasn't it? it? It to do with the American audience and stuff. But uh, yeah, interesting. Well, you say that. Uh, I don't know. I think they they just had this thing about dubbing younger actresses with older actresses' voices because do you remember in uh, Grace Skull, Legend of Tarzan? that um, Andy McDowell's voice was dubbed by Glenn Close. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it was quite common. Ob obviously, you know, it was done a lot in the uh, in the early Bond films as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, but, you know, I, I thought Kroll was a lot of fun. Uh, it was really good to go back and, and visit. Um you, you, you know the, the the effects work was was pretty decent on this. We're going to talk effects. We have to talk about the the way the slayers die, <laughs> because um, every time one of these creatures gets killed, you hear this distinctive scream, and then you see this what looks like a brain worm or snake yeah. come out the top and then go into into the ground. No matter where they are, they, it could be concrete, and these things will go into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's quite, I mean, you know, there was a lot of imagination um, in this film. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, it's it, it de decent effects. It's a good story. Uh, I mean, you know, it's kind of the hero's journey again. Uh, but, you know, hey, it works. Um, great score, as we've already mentioned, by, by James Horner. Um, some really good miniature effects work by, by Derek Meddings. Um, you know, imaginative stunt work by uh, Vic Armstrong. So yeah, I mean, a lot of the uh, a lot of the the players of the day um, certainly certainly you know showed their craft in this. But but yeah, in terms of Peter Yates, we're talking. You know, this couldn't be more different than Bullet. But you know, works really well. You know, you know, as a film in its own right and. Uh, uh, you know, really interesting. I'm glad you. I'm glad you picked it because it was a nice, a nice visit back to my youth, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's great, and it's as I say, if you want to see young uh, Liam Neeson and Robbie Coltrane, then uh, they there you go. And I always love uh, Bernard Breslau in there as the Cyclops. Oh yeah, I mean the Cyclops character. Yeah. That's great. You know. Um, and uh, yeah, really, really well done. The whole thing. Really. Well, it's great for the fact that um, the the whole backstory about how his race of people were tricked by the beasts. They were given the um, they gave up one of their eyes so that they could see the future. But he tricked them by the fact that the only future they could see was their own death. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, his death was quite gruesome. He got crushed. <laughs> oh my God, that was. As I say, this is really hard PG. This is. It's not a film for little kids. No, no. And, and, you know, one of the things they do do very well in this is, you know, they, they establish the characters and the ensembles quite well. Um, and, yeah, when, you know, when, when they do st sort of start dropping like flies towards the end of the film, um, you, you, you know, you do actually, you, you have made some investment in them and you do actually feel quite sad, um, you, you know, in some of the cases. So, uh so yeah, re 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 really nicely done. Um, obviously, Liam Neeson's set of special skills in this film is being a womanizer. 
If there's a woman, uh, I will find you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it was, it was good. It was good to see him in, in Coltrane and, and whatever in, in those in those earlier roles as as interestingly supporting characters. But um, you, you know, one, ones that went on and to, to have bigger careers than the leads. So um, yeah, <laughs> just goes to show you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well. Uh, we're going to move on to our movie hell just after this break. Kane, the Stone Cold Assassin. Three men, Corbin Taylor, Zeke Jones and Jesse Williams were held for questioning by Marshall Gazer. His revenge will be swift. Ain't you the law around here, Sheriff? Nowhere to run. No place to hide. Jesse, you ever meet Kane? The new violent and bloody horror short from director. Red Wolf Pines. Is that what you told Luke? He died like the dog he was. Starring Keith Miles as Kane. That bastard ain't gonna find us out here. Available on YouTube and official website www.apocalypticconservatory.com. Red Wolf Pines. Rated R for Rowdy. So, you're making a film. Horror film. Meta horror film. A horror film about horror film. Horror film about cinema. And why would you do that? Life is so beautiful. You just have something in your eye. I thought you said you wanted to do something different. Why do the same thing that everyone else is doing? It drive me mad. They all have opinion on everything. Nobody listen to me. Nobody try to understand anything. Just too much. I found out recently that I had a, a syndrome when I was younger. When I try to go to sleep, the whole world will change. Like everything will go too quick, too slow, or too big, too small. I could control it. Benny Loves Killing. Available now on Vimeo and IndieFlix. And if they don't go for it, you'll kill them all. What's the matter, Jane? It's kind of hard to explain. I can't put my finger on it. But there's definitely something wrong. Jane? Well, I suppose we can't expect her to get over it just like that. You want to be past this? It's so, so bright. Why is it so bright in here? It's just the dawn, Jane. You have to take her to the hospital. Have her placed under constant watch. Well, that much I know, but who done it? Don't even try and stop me. You know I'm going to harm you, yet you do nothing. What about that wonderful husband of yours? Oh, Martin. I love him. Well, someone has to die. Blood and Roses. Available now on Amazon.com. On DVD and video on demand. And we're back. And so, uh, Keith, what is your pick for Movie Hell? All right. Well, I mean, I had a look through um, uh, Peter Yates's filmography. And, and you, you know, there, there are some films on there that I hadn't seen. Um, some that I'd not seen for, for many years and, and, and didn't really remember. And unfortunately, much as I'd have liked to, I didn't really have the time to sort of go back and revisit any, you, you know, everything that he's done, because there were certainly 
some films uh, that I remember uh, sort of in the late 80s and early 90s that he did that I thought were, were really good. Like um, I really enjoyed uh, An Innocent Man and Suspects and, y y you know, things like that. But what I, what I decided to pick for, um, for, for Hell, which was something, I ha again, I hadn't seen in many years, I actually went for a film that he did in 1977 called The Deep, okay, which was uh, another uh, underwater adventure film um, based on, on uh, Peter Benchley's novel, um, The Deep. Not, not only is it based on his novel, but he wrote the screenplay. Yeah, yeah, okay, and he, he wrote the screenplay for this one as well. Um, obviously, sort of riding on the success of, of, of Jaws from a, from a couple of years earlier that we, we've obviously talked in great detail about in, um, in, in, the, in the Spielberg um, uh, podcast that we did. But, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I picked this and I thought, oh, is this going to be controversial? You, you know, how bad can this be? Let's let's have a look and see if it if, if it works or not. Um, but going back to it, I have to say uh, this this did feel like a bit of a. How can I describe it? it it's, it's not necessarily a bad film, but uh, I certainly don't think it's one of his better films. Uh, I found this to be. I found this to have some pacing issues, but not, you know, not in the same way as we talked about with with, with Bullet, where even though it was slow in places, um, it, it, it totally worked. With the deep, um, I didn't really get that uh, that that feeling with this film. Um, you, you know, it's I'm not 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 to say it isn't a well well made film. Um, you know, some of the underwater uh, photography. It is very well done. Um, obviously, the actors, as well as Peter Yates himself, had to had to become, uh, you know, trained in, in scuba diving in order to do this film. And, um, you, you know, it was quite a bit to, to pull off uh, filming in, you know, real underwater sequences in in shipwrecks and, and, and things of that nature. Um, but it just I don't know. It just to me, it just felt like it was it was kind of lacking something, um, which was sort of hard to put my finger on. Uh, again, um, we, we mentioned about him working not with the same composers, but with composers that are that are sort of very much of the time that he's making the film. And in this case, he worked with, um, you know, John Barry, who was obviously you know very famous for his, his work on the on the Bond films. Um, and uh, you, you know, you know. Again, this this had a very very good soundtrack. Um, it was produced by Peter Goober uh, prior to you know he obviously went on to produce the the Tim Burton Batman films. Um, and one of the other things that sort of connects it, if you like, a little bit to Jaws is is one of the stars of this is actually Robert Shaw. Um, it, he also uses Jacqueline Bisset again, who who he'd, he'd obviously worked with in Bullet. And um, a young Nick Nolte uh, in in this film, um, uh, and and also it does you know not in the same way by any stretch of the imagination, but it does have a an, an underwater creature as well in this it, it, in the form of a moray eel um, that, that that that's hiding in the shipwreck uh, that they go down and and, and explore. Um, and, and the actual plot itself, I mean, I think the actual storyline is quite interesting. I just thought that the, the that the film itself, for me, felt rather rather laboured, and I almost felt like it was kind of being one of these films that was trying to um, to cash in somewhat on the success of of, of Jaws, and uh, even having a, a very similar poster in, in 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 some respects. Yeah, you. I mean, you totally hit the nail on the head there with. The fact that this was sort of they, it, it, I imagine it's got pushed through very quickly, and you know it's it's very reminiscent of Jaws. I mean, down as you say to the poster. Uh, also, you know Robert Shaw being in there because I remember seeing this on TV when I was a kid, and it would usually be on around the same time as Jaws was on. It's ITV's. I think they used to do it like a double bill. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, 
So you you sort of would get like this like three week run where you get Jaws, Jaws two, and and the Deep. And the thing was, as a kid, I got the, I always get this confused with Jaws. And and there was I, I mean I hadn't watched it in a long time, so I sat down and watched it for this. I was trying to think, remember anything that you know that kind of struck to me as a kid. And the only thing I can remember is the bit where Jacqueline Bissett is in her apartment in the hotel room where they do the voodoo ritual to her. Mm-hmm. And you have like Nick Nolte trying to his best to to, <laughs> to get up to, which I have to say is I, I found quite funny. I didn't think uh, I didn't think it was a very good action scene. I mean, the whole thing with him climbing up the lift <laughs> to get up there. And I'm, I'm thinking you would have been quicker going up the steps. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> the amount of trouble it took him. Yeah. The basic sort of premise of this is is Nick Nolte and Jacqueline Bissett play a um a couple on vacation in Bermuda, Bermuda. Sorry, I put my teeth back in, and um, That's it. they they are scuba diving and they they scuba dive into a, a shipwreck, and um, they 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 discover that there are um, well, there's there's two discoveries. There's there's the, there's the discovery that there could be some um, if you like treasure. Uh, on board this but also there is a um uh there are ampules of of morphine um that 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 are under there and 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 preserved and of course uh they they begin to investigate this and what happens is there's there's um this this gang of um haitian uh um i guess drug smugglers i suppose you would call them that um that, that that are interested in 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 what you know is in the wreck also and they, they kind of but by default sort of put themselves in danger uh because of exploring this and, and and you say about the scenes you sort of remember i always remember i mean they set up the moray eel quite early on in so much as jacqueline Bassett's character is trying to um uh reach into part of the wreck to actually uh um grab a, a jewel or a coin or something that she finds and she gets pulled by the moray eel and it sort of pulls her arm into the wreck and it's it's quite i mean that that bit is quite actually quite effective it's quite um quite quite a scary scene and of course watching it watching it now as an adult uh, as an adult male <laughs> i kind of see what the other appeal was in so much i think peter goober's joked that the uh the, the T-shirt made him a lot of money because um, this definitely sort of set Jacqueline Bassett up as a, as a sex symbol in so much as she went diving, um, you, you know, wearing, uh, you know, diving trunks, but also just a, a white T-shirt. <laughs> so it, it did turn into the wet T-shirt competition <laughs> when she came out. And uh, I could say, oh, yeah, I could see what the appeal of this was. <laughs> <laughs> from that level <laughs> yeah but, i mean the thing is i remember it, that the sort of the attack by the more ill but um like you i thought it was the shipwreck but it wasn't it was it was actually kind of like on a reef near the the wreck oh that's correct sort of yes it was that's yeah, right yeah, yeah. and it ends up sort of living in the ship doesn't it <laughs> i have to say that more ill was not scary at all especially Ooh. the bit when nick nolte uh confronts it and it's just Kind of like close up, Nick Nolte looking scared. Close up, Nick Nolte looking scared. Close up, Nick Nolte looking. And it's just like <laughs> it looked like it was like on the end of a stick, and somebody was just pushing it towards the camera. It just looked so hokey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I must admit, yeah. it didn't. It didn't. And um, I'm trying to remember what it was, but they had a like they called Bruce, uh, the shark Bruce in Jaws. They had a nickname for the Moray Eel, and I can't remember what it is now. I did I did either listen to something or read something where they talked about that, but it's gone out of my head completely, which is annoying, annoying but there you go. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the thing is, with, with, with these sort of films, um, underwater sequences sort of by default are quite difficult because not only are they obviously difficult for cast and crew to actually uh film in the first place but in terms of 
filmmaking, you, you know, it slows down action. Uh, obviously, it's limited on what sound effects you can have. Um, and, you know, it has been done very well, like, you know, Thunderball um, had amazing underwater sequences uh, in it. Um, but, uh, y y you know, this, uh, you know, it's not like it was a bad film, but I just I just sort of felt that it didn't it didn't quite live up to some of the other things that he'd done. So uh, hence why for me, um, y you know, he, I decided to to go with this one is movie hell really okay i found the nickname for the moray eel not as impressive as jaws but his nickname was percy there you go <laughs> yeah yeah so uh yeah but um yeah you, you know it, as, as i said it had it, it had its good points um uh obviously you know a good good cast in there i mean nick nolte jacqueline Bisset, um and robert shaw but also you've got lou, lou, lou gossett jr and um Eli Wallach uh yeah. roles in this as well. Um Yeah, I did feel that Eli Wallach was a bit wasted. Yes. Yeah, to he, the truth. Didn't, he didn't have a great deal to do. Um I I, I, no. I I just think that overall, I mean apparently there was a there is a TV version of this movie which I've not seen, which is actually about fifty five minutes longer and it's got uh, it's got some more backstory. You actually see you know, it starts off in the past and you see the ship, um, you know, get bombed and, and, and sunk, uh, you know, during World War II, um, which I believe they spent quite a lot of money on that scene, but it doesn't end up in the in the normal cut of the film. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I found that it is at 124 minutes, which the, uh, you know, the theatrical version was that. To me, it felt like quite a long 124 minutes. I mean, there's quite a bit going on in this, but I, I did feel that this definitely had some pacing issues for me anyway. I, I, I kind of... Um... It had a lot of patient, pacing issues. Yeah. And the, the other thing as well, watching it this time, was, you know, that's, that's, things like with Robert Shaw just diving in his, you know, his, his shirt and trousers <laughs> you know no wetsuit or anything he just you know i'm a man i just put my um put my air air tank on and go uh, yeah thank yeah. you yeah i put my air tank on and go yeah and it's just it was like really yeah you you're you're sort of diving around a wreck like that and you've got no protection also i thought the I wasn't a big fan of the, the, the shark attack scene. I didn't think that worked particularly well. Even though the shots, they actually went to the barrier, the Great Barrier Reef to, to shoot those uh, the sharks going frenzy and stuff. And some poor sod had to, I think, get attached to, uh, to cables and get pulled around and stuff. Because uh, it had to match up with the action in the, uh, in the film. But problem was the sharks looked too small they just didn't they didn't look like they were man eaters or that they could do any damage yeah i mean, I mean they probably were i mean they're probably you know quite accurate but uh they looked more like a you know when you go to the aquarium here in england and they go we got a shark no i agree <laughs> and you I agree. Got pitch, you got pictures of like you know jaws and it's just this little thing going around so yeah, no, I think underwater stuff is quite hard to do. And, um, you, you, you know, I mean, the, the, the team that actually uh, uh, did the underwater filming and whatever with this, I, I know that they, you know, they went on a few years later to do um, uh, For Your Eyes Only and, uh, you, you know, have worked on, on, on other films that take place uh, in the ocean and what whatever. But, uh no, I mean, it, it's a tough thing to do. I'm not sure it works entirely well uh, in this no. film. You know, absolute hats off to Peter Yates for taking this on because he, he must have been, I'm guessing he was sort of in his 50s by this point and, um, you know, learning to scuba dive and, you know, direct underwater. I mean, that's no that's no easy thing to do, I'm sure. Um, but uh, But overall, I mean you know the film just i know it's very popular and i know a lot of people still like it so um 
this is just purely as these things always are these are just my my personal opinion and my experience of it but i didn't remember a lot of it from from sort of back in the day and um I sort of picked it on a whim to sort of see, you know, to sort of do the the whole Jaws connection, Jaws comparison. And, um, yeah, you know, I, I found even though it had good elements um, overall, you, you know, I, I thought this film was 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 problematic and um, certain certainly one of for me, one of the the weaker entries in a, in a good uh, portfolio of films that, that P, Peter Yates has. Oh yeah, and also one of the weakest uh, Peter Benchley um, creatures as well. I, I think the Moira Moira Hill wasn't much of a threat. I didn't buy uh, Lewis Gossett Jr. <laughs> death by eel. <laughs> just it didn't didn't it, it just it did look ridiculous, didn't it? It did a bit, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, it it lacked a bit of tension, I thought, and. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, as I said, I think it's been very successful from what I understand. But um, and it is definitely one of those films that, that cropped up a lot on television, uh, like you said. And that's definitely when I first saw it. But I think at the time I was I was too young to really appreciate anything about it. I just want to sort of talk about Pete eventually just for a bit. But um, I think he he's a bit more successful when it's 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 to do with a, you know, a sea creature. Because I thought the uh, TV adaptation of The Beast was very good. Right, yes. The one with uh, William Peterson in it. That's right, yeah. I've not the, seen that in a long time, but yeah. The the big squid, yeah. Yeah. No, I thought that I, I, that was far more entertaining than this. I think that it, it's just one of those things where it's like, um, it wasn't quite sure if it was a thriller, you know, if it was a, a drug thriller or if it was a treasure hunt or if it was a creature feature, as in with the uh, Moray Eel. Because um, it, it, it was kind of sort of having all those different elements. And uh, yeah, I mean, personally, they just, it don't I don't think it gelled too well. And uh, the whole thing with the voodoo as well was, for me, didn't work. It felt like they didn't sort of 100% commit to that. It was kind of there, but they didn't really sort of go for it. Well, it, it's sort of it, after the bit with um, Jacqueline Bissett being, you know, kind of attacked in a, a hotel room where they do that sort of voodoo uh, ritual, which I, you know, I think as a kid I thought was kind of unnerving, but now it just it looks a bit silly. They kind of drop it after that. It didn't feel hugely satisfying this one, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so you know, I sort of stuck with it and thought well this is this is what i'm gonna this is what i'm gonna pick as movie hell for this one because um certain certainly compared to the the, the two films that we've already mentioned um i think this one is, is is dull in comparison yeah yeah right well we're gonna move on <laughs> i'm gonna move on to my pick uh <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> well, um, where do you begin with this? Well, hey, I th I think he, hats off that he pulled it off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Um, that the film I've picked is Don Quixote from two thousand, and this was a TV movie. And this was made by the same production company that uh, made the likes of Merlin. I think it was Hallmark Entertainment. Yeah, it it it's 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 it certainly has that kind of budget. <laughs> yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, right. Now, I I can't be sure, but I believe this was a uh, a passion project for John Lithgow. Well, he produced it, didn't he? He was the producer on it, right? I I think he also had a hand in writing it. Oh, really? Okay. Well, uh, adapting yes. the, the novel yeah. to the screenplay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because it's a fairly true adaption, isn't it? Hence why it's a long movie. I mean, this is actually, I'm guessing this was shown in sort of two parts or something because it's, it's like um, two and a half hours, isn't it? Yeah, it was a long bloody watch. Yeah. I, I, this film absolutely dragged. It really dragged. 
Right. Now I I caught this on channel four when it was uh was shown and the thing was this is I saw it after I'd saw um Lost in La Mancha. It actually made me go back and watch that actually. It made watching this made me go back and watch Lost in La Mancha. <laughs> me me too. Me too, because um we were we were robbed of a great Don Quixote film. And I think Terry Gilliam sort of kind of hit on the the I I think a great idea of of it ha- having a twist on it not being a sort of so faithful retelling of it. It just doesn't seem to have any pace to it. I mean it just it just plods along and it's I mean I, I like John Lithgow. I think John Lithgow's a very good actor. And I also like Bob Hoskins, but um, it's just, they, I don't know. It was like, it was being aimed at kids. Kind of, yeah, it was aimed at kids, but talking down to kids. It felt very family friendly. Um, it definitely yeah. had that family friendly feel to it. There's a bit where, you know, um, he goes out on his initial adventures. And uh, if you don't know who, what Don Quixote is about, it's, it's about this old man who's been he's been reading books all his life and he decides to relive his childhood which is has done really terribly with we keep seeing this flashback of him as a really bratty kid hitting <laughs> the uh the grass with a stick oh and he he decides he wants to become a knight and he's going to go out there and he's going to have adventures Romantic adventures, very much, yes. <laughs> yes, he, he's going to be like an, uh, you know, he he christens himself Don Quixote, Quixote of uh, of La Mancha, and um, he is fighting for the honor, honor of uh, Dolcina, who's played by Vanessa Williams, who um, is not exactly great in this. <laughs> no, <laughs> no it, it's just uh, i think it's just the way it's presented i mean it's really it's not presented very well it's sort of very, there's, there doesn't seem to be any flair to it at all it's just very matter of fact but my point what i was going to try and make was so when he comes back from his initial adventures back to his home uh the, this character the priest who he just seems to be there, but you just don't know anything about him. Decides that the the best the thing to cure him is to get rid of all his books. I know it felt cruel. I thought it was cruel almost, didn't you? <laughs> I, I felt it was very cruel. But did you feel anything when that was happening? That was the thing. I didn't feel anything. It it should have been the most really heartbreaking moment. I mean, the fact that this guy had lived off these books. You know, this was his whole adventures. You know, it's like if somebody took your DVD collection, Keith, mm-hmm. and burnt it. You know, they'd be dead. Yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there, were, there didn't feel like there was a lot of pathos for it at the end, and um, no. Uh, no, yeah, it, it, it's it's. Uh, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because let, let's be honest, this, you, you know, they, they always talk about like the curse of Superman or whatever, but, but let's be honest, Don Quixote in terms of a film um, has been that sort of curse project as well because, you know, Orson Welles spent many years trying to, to make it and, um, you know, film parts of it, but it was never completed. And then, like you said, we were kind of robbed of, of, of the whole Terry Gilliam um, version of this tale, which yeah. again was massively a, a, pa- a passion project for for Terry, for, you, you know Gilliam for many years. I mean, he's a very interesting yeah. director, isn't he? You, you you know you know what it, it it always comes down to. It always comes down to that the um, there's always a problem with the main character who's going to play Don Quixote because Don Quixote is an elderly man, and so. They cast elderly men to play it, and this, in fact, with the Orson Welles version and Terry Gilliam version, you know, with Orson Welles, his lead actor died. Yes. And with Terry Gilliam, um, you know, he um, he wasn't well enough, and it was the fact that was he couldn't ride a horse, which is 
you know, one of the main things he has to do in um, in in the film. I mean, the, 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 one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of this is the fact that I I did feel like you know I saw this on TV and I was like I I felt angry towards it because it's like why is this piece of shit? <laughs> so I just use a strong word. Why am I watching this piece of shit? And I could have been watching the Terry Gilliam version and. You know, and as you as as everybody knows who have watched Lost in La Mancha, you know, it, it seems to be God was against that film. I yeah, mean, big time. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, the whole sort of you know, if it and and the Spanish army with their fighter jets flying over. Yeah. Oh no, I mean it was nothing but bad luck. Absolutely. When I watched that, I, my heart just goes out to to everybody involved because I mean the other person who gets hard done by on that set was the first AD. Big time. You know, yeah. Oh. Yeah, no, it, it was an impossible situation. But I mean it, with, with regards to this film, you know, hats off to Peter Yates in so much as he got it made. Um and you know kind of blessed John Lithgow because you could so tell that he absolutely relished playing this role. You, 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 you can kind of see that, even though the film itself doesn't work particularly well. Um, you, you, you know, you could see that, that this is a role that John Lithgow wanted to play. Um, but like you said, it was it was very restricted by not only a television budget, but also. Um, you know, the fact that it, it had to be family friendly to the nth degree. Um, yeah. Bob Hoskins, again, bless him, very likable, but he's kind of just phoning it in, really, isn't he? <laughs> he is. And uh, I mean, I was I was talking to this to my girlfriend the other day about this. and It did feel like after he'd been appeared in Hook that every sort of role he took on after that had to be kind of family friendly and that kind of, you know, Smee type of character. Yeah, to me, it did feel a bit kid. like Smee. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it did feel like a bit like Smee in this. Yeah. From what I could tell, this this was kind of like fairly sort of true to the, the source material. Um, but... Yeah, it, it, it did. It just, it just, it did feel a bit cheesy. Um... And yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to, you, you, you know, it was weird. It was weird to watch this because it was, it was God long. I mean, I was like, geez. Yeah. Right. But, and, and it was funny because in some parts I was kind of like, I found it sort of endearing and I thought, Oh, bless them, you know, but at the same time, it just kind of, it, it sort of lacked any sort of real, depth or soul it was it was just kind of a it was almost like you know let's just put a play on of the uh, of, of of the novel um without sort of having anything much underneath that and um yeah yeah i mean it was just you know it, it just made me think god i'd have liked to have seen the gilliam version <laughs> yeah yeah because it was made at the same time i'm guessing wasn't it approximately is it the same year or within a year or something? No, well, it, it well, no, it, it came. It was made before. Oh, was it? Um, Gideon's oh, okay. Film. Yes, it, the same time. it came out. In, it came out in two thousand, oh, okay. and um, he was making. Um, it was around ninety nine, two thousand, when uh, he was making um, the, the the man who killed Don Quixote. Right. I always thought it was the man who shot Don Quixote. I thought he was going for a kind of uh, man who shot. Uh, uh, Liberty Valance kind of right, right. Up, but um, <laughs> but it's the man who killed Don Quixote. Um, oh, I'll say um, I was I was really it was it was nice to see some act- <laughs> some actors in it. I like I liked it when Graham Croden was there, and um, he he's the old he was the old boy from uh, Waiting for God. Okay, if you remember that TV series, mm, not especially. No, but okay. okay, well. Oh right. Well, he was one of my favourite teachers in If. Oh okay. He was the history professor. Yes, he yes. would ride he would ride into his classroom on a bicycle. 
<laughs> and uh, also a very early role for James Perf- Purefoy. Well, he played both the, what was it, the, the Night of the Moon, but also the, um, I forgot what they called the other one, the one he defeated and the one he defeated him. Oh. It, was, it was the Night of the Moon and it was the Night of the Cups. Something like that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, we had um, uh, the Frenchman from The Matrix in it as well, oh, we playing did. the Duke. Yes, uh, Lambert. Yeah. Uh, was it Lambert Wilson? Wilson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Lambert Wilson, yeah. Yeah. Which I have to say, he, he doesn't get used very well in, in in British or American films. I mean, do you remember? Did you saw that film at Fright Fest last year, the one he was in, the one that was a remake It'll remind me. What it was I can't called. remember. Um, it was about the um, the robbers who kidnap a, a father and a daughter. Oh, that's right. Yes, I um, can't remember the title of it, but yes, it was. The oh, one, rabid that's dogs. It, rabid dogs. Yeah, which was rabid dogs. He was very good. In yeah, that. and uh, it, much better than Bloody Matrix. Oh, there you go. Yeah, and of course, <laughs> Isabella Rossellini was playing the Duchess in this one. So I mean. It, it, for yeah, a TV movie, it yeah. had some names in it, that's for sure. But um... Well, the thing is, around that time, Isabella Rossellini seemed to appear in all these Hallmark films. Um, because she had done Merlin, and she'd been a much bigger role in that. And this, she was, I don't know, she was only in it for like 20 minutes or so. Right. And then that was it. Yet yet she's like billed the third, third person in the, in the billing. It's just like... <sighs> <laughs> should have been Anne, not a <laughs> you know she's hard, hardly in it i mean vanessa williams is in it more than she is yeah and that isn't very much so um yeah i mean um you know this uh, it, it, it's just kind of I, I don't think it's necessarily bad i just think it's just near you know it's just it's it's just it's just okay, but it's not, um, you know, it's not anything sort of groundbreaking here, is it? And it's interesting that, you know. Well, it's, 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 I have to say, it's, it's two and a half hours of my life. I want to yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it did feel overly long. Um, it, it, it did. And it, it just, uh, as you say, it, it did feel like let's put on a play. Yeah. You know, it, it felt like, a, you know, an amateur production of it. And um, also, it's just sort of—I'm not quite sure what time frame it was in because, oh, because I, again, I'm sort of going from what I saw in Lost in the Mancha, but the um, the uniforms and everything seemed to be a lot older in that film than it was in this one. So I wasn't quite sure what time frame this was in and stuff. It just—it did seem to be a bit all over the the place with like the costumes and stuff. Because like the uh, guards and everything, they looked like they were set in this century, let in say previous centuries before. It's just it just seemed to be a bit very odd. Mm. I, I couldn't quite put my finger on what the what time it was supposed to be set in. Yeah, because it was kind of I don't know it was like the sixteen hundreds or whatever originally, wasn't it? I think, but um, yeah, but yeah. Well, I mean, also the also the fact that. Um, with the Don Quixote characters, you, you you want to sort of believe in his fantasy, and um, and so when he becomes sane at the end, uh, you know, you 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 feel loss for yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a tragic character, really, isn't it? Yeah, and but again, it just, I mean, you know, bless him, you know, John Lithgow, you know, he he did the best he could with the material, but he just. It just, I just not, I wasn't feeling it. <laughs> really, you know, it should have been a really sad moment. It wasn't exactly. I mean, I think what they what they did capture, what did um, work, was the, you, you know, the, the 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 sense of adventure and the romantic ideals and in kind of that side of the character. But but the 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 tragic part at the end didn't didn't really, you, you know, resonate that highly. So. Um, so, so you kind of just had the one note, really. Um, you, you know. On no, this. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't think they caught the the fantasy side either. I mean, it was too much of his. You know, oh, he's just raving mad. Isn't well, he? yeah, they made him just look crazy. But uh, 
because because obviously they did that thing where you know we are we could obviously see what he saw but then obviously we could see what everybody else saw as well i think it would have been better if they'd done it one way or the other yeah i i don't know um gilliam's take would have been because Gill- gilliam had played around with it a little bit by putting the johnny the character that johnny depp was going to play into the mix as well wasn't it which yeah. was supposed to be yeah. was it someone from the modern world or something that's transported back yeah yeah he's like a sales executive or something like that right yeah. to give it like a quirky element but yeah 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 but i mean it that kind of what he did with the fisher king yes you know where he took the the radio dj and then heading up with some you know somebody who thought he was a knight see that's the thing this is the thing see why why it would have been better with terry gilliam is terry gilliam can bring you into somebody's fantasy so better than it was done in this i was just as you were just talking about i was thinking about that scene where you know robin williams is um sees the girl that he really likes and he that he immediately goes into this fantasy where everybody's dancing in the train station. Yeah. And it, you, you just see it. And it's just so fantastical and it's great. And it's just so well done. And this, you know, it was, it was the fantasy stuff. They would just sort of cut away to a shot of a giant. Yeah. When he, but it would be mostly with the windmills. You didn't see him actually try and fight a giant. You just saw one shot of somebody they CGI'd in. Or several people they CGI in to be giants. Yeah, and you just you didn't really get a sense of that fantasy, and that's it. it was really missing that. It, uh, it was reeking of no budget, wasn't it, or low budget? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a shame because you know I thought they did really well with Merlin, the with Sam Neil. You know, I thought that that first one they did with him was really good. And I mean, that one was well. I imagine it's about the same running time, but when watching it on Channel Four, you're looking at four hours with adverts. Right, yeah. And I thought that was much better done, but um, and this one, unfortunately, no, <laughs> not no, all. no. And I see where you're coming from. I mean, um, yeah, yeah. This wasn't this again. Peter Yates done some good stuff, but this, this, this was just kind of average. Um, and uh, you know, uh, t- definitely, you know, Terry Gilliam would be a interesting director to talk about at some point i'm 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 thinking um but, oh yeah uh, we'll have to yeah do. but uh no i'm I, I know what you mean as i said i saw it I've, i kind of watched it now i hadn't seen it before uh no real desire to see it again um <laughs> but uh yeah yeah it's just it, it's just a very a very light tv movie um and that's exactly how it felt. And it just didn't have anything, anything extra done to it. So, I mean, you, you know, I, I think, I think overall Peter Yates, um, you know, he's done, he's done some really good films in there, some really top stuff. He's had a go at a bit of everything, but he's also done some stuff, which is, which is just average as well. That was his penultimate film. I mean, he did uh, another film, four years later called a separate piece which was another tv not movie, seen so. that one i have to say no, yeah no no well i yeah i mean i'm just looking at his uh filmography now and um i, I do remember suspects when that came out yeah yeah no absolutely i remember that as well um and uh that was the um that was the one with Cher, was yeah it? and dennis quaid i believe that's yeah. it yes yeah that's right yeah, and that was good. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed Tom Selleck, you know, in An Innocent Man. Again, I have not seen that in a long time, but um, uh, at the time I thought that was pretty good. Uh, the House on Carroll Street, you know, I mean, he's he's got some he's got some good good, good stuff in there, definitely. But um, I I think definitely Bullet and Kroll are his um, are his standouts in amongst that lot, mm. definitely. Well, yeah, I mean, he did um, uh, the dresser was. Is supposed to be very good, you know. It's got Albert Finney and Tom Courtney in it, right? Right. And and Edward Fox. And, I'm not even sure I've know. seen that, if I'm honest. Um, or if I have, it's been a long time. <laughs> Probably know of it because um, it's about um, like a, an actor who um, he has like a a, a dresser who's just like his confidant and, and stuff like that. So it's it's I think it's based off a play. No, absolutely. And of course, Murphy's War 
that's another one um he did not a big fan of it i mean it's it's a, an interesting concept you know man versus submarine yeah yeah <laughs> but uh yeah I, I i did have that on dvd i think i got it free with the daily mail but uh yeah i was not a big fan of it no i mean very much an old school filmmaker um oh know, definitely but, yes but um yeah you know definitely definitely some influential work in there and um you know some some, some good movies so ho- hopefully uh you know hopefully people have found this one to to be interesting as it is it's not necessarily uh someone that's obvious in in in, in springs to mind like some of the uh some of the big name directors that we've talked about. <laughs> I know, but it's always good to see a British boy. Oh, definitely. Done well. Yeah. Done extremely well for himself. Absolutely. I'm going to put that interview up on our Facebook page because it's, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, he's, he was certainly um, a man who didn't take himself too seriously. And uh, he certainly loved uh, what he did. I, when they, I remember one of the in- interviewers asked him, what he would have done if he wasn't a film director and uh he was quite sort of taken aback because it was kind of like oh i don't know what i would have been if i wasn't a film director i quite like being a film director we'd all like that wouldn't we (laughs) so yeah no i mean uh by the way he does he um you know again for anyone who's interested in this sort of thing um on the on the Blu-ray of Bullet, uh, he actually does do a commentary track on that, and it's it's quite interesting because he does very much talk about um, you know the relationship with with Steve McQueen, um, but he also he he talks very much about the sort of old school way of uh, of the way films were made back then, and even gets into things like you know. The fact that they didn't have the fast lenses and fast film stock back in the day, and uh, y- y- you know some of the some of the uh, issues that that would cause. So, for anyone who's kind of interested in that history of filmmaking and filmmaking techniques, it, it, it's it's not a bad commentary track um, to listen to. So, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. All right. I think that's a good place to end it. Indeed. So. We're going to end in our customary manner. So, Keith, where can we find your work? Yeah, if you go to uh, YouTube and put in British Isles, spelled E-Y-L-E-S, as in my last name, um, there are some short films on there that I've written, produced and directed for your viewing pleasure. And you can always find my work at independentrunnings.com. You can listen to this uh, podcast on iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Mixcloud and YouTube. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, please uh, leave us a rating and a review on iTunes and Stitcher. Yeah, and do share this with anyone that you uh, think might be interested as well. Uh, You know, if you've got film film geek friends out there that might find uh, the stuff we talk about interesting, please pass the link on, you know. Uh, It's always good to grow that that listening base. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think that goes without saying. I'm sure people are sharing us left, right, and centre. <laughs> Hope so. If not, they should be. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, what's wrong with you all? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love you all. Um, I'm sure you, you're all sharing it. This particular pass of the alphabet. Mm. Yes. Who could that be? Yes. <laughs> Who could that be? I'm sure you know who it's going to be. (laughs) (laughs) If you listen to this podcast, I'm I'm sure, um, you know, I think it's odds are 50 to 1, you're going to guess what. We're just too too (laughs) damn predictable, aren't we? (laughs) (laughs) Well, join us for uh, our next episode of Movie Heaven, Movie Hell. 